contrary to the narrative that we're often fed about global warming, it's not caused by human beings as such. Now, stop clenching, it's okay, I'm not getting into climate change denial here. But when we essentialise the cause of global warming to humans, or, I don't know, human nature, we often miss that the real underlying cause is the extractivist and constantly expanding nature of global capitalism. Um, I'm being very clever and, you know, filming in, in, in outside to, to talk about climate change because, like, climate, get genius. Today we're generally reaching a point of consensus that climate change is happening and that it's caused by man-made factors. But there's another form of climate change denial that's taken root at the... Uh, political, corporate and media establishments that we can solve global warming with green growth or a few market solutions just peppered in around that green growth. This is a form of climate change denial that accepts the premise that climate change is happening but denies the scope of the problem or the scale of changes needed to solve it. All so that it can basically protect the system of neoliberal capitalism under which we all live. And that's what this video is about. The scale of the problem of global warming, how we can fix it, and the dark future if capitalist ideology wins out over the scientifically mandated solutions that we need. Remember, throughout all of this, that climate change isn't just about global warming, but it's about global justice too. And it won't all be outside, don't worry. Although you might be able to see my dog sometimes. Part 1. Where are we now? So, we all know of the Paris Climate Agreement, which was hailed as a great moment for all of the international community to really come together and finally tackle climate change. And today, the world has officially crossed the threshold for the Paris Agreement to take effect. Today the world meets the moment, and if we follow through on the commitments that this Paris Agreement embodies, history may well judge it as a turning point for our planet. The main takeaway from the agreement was that states would ensure that global temperatures wouldn't rise above 2 degrees warming. That's 2 degrees warming Celsius, not Fahrenheit, for you American weirdos. After protestation from island and global south states who are already suffering from the deleterious effects of climate change and for whom even 1.5 degrees warming would result in, you know, death, a loose target was added to the Paris Climate Agreements for states to pursue efforts to limit temperature increases to only 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Efforts. And already here we can see the political unevenness of the responses to global warming. The pleading from less powerful island and global south states to limit warming to levels which aren't just destructive to them is translated at the global level to, yeah maybe, maybe we'll try and do that if we're vibing. So how are we doing with even these limited targets? Well, the picture isn't exactly rosy. Existing warming trends and the maintenance of the current business as usual is predicted to lead to an average of 4.2 degrees warming by 2100. If each state meets its current mandates under the Paris Climate Agreement, then the trends are set to be slightly lower and reach only 3.3 .3 degrees warming, still massively overshooting the 1.5 and 2 degree targets. Basically meaning that the measures taken under the Paris Climate Agreement are woefully lacking even by their own standards. Where we are now, we can see the increased frequency of intense weather events due to warming oceans and intense heat waves. And if we carry on at the rate we're going, these events are just gonna become more and more common, resulting in food instability, refugees, and uh, death. This is particularly grim because of the inequalities at play. Global North states are responsible for 92% of global CO2 emissions outside of safe planetary boundaries and rely on the appropriation of resources from the Global South. 
On top of this, almost 50% of global emissions are produced by the top 10% of the global population, whereas 70% is produced by the top 20%. And the brunt of the dire effects of global warming are now being mostly experienced by states in the global south. A 2018 World Bank study estimated, conservatively, that around 140 million people could become displaced because of the effects of global warming. This isn't some possible future. This is what will happen if we keep doing what we're doing. It's a certainty, unless we change it. Ugh. See, this is where I'd normally take a massive exaggerated swig out of a gross, or, or not so gross, drink to indicate my frustration with everything. But I feel like that's become a crutch recently, so I won't do that this time. That's, you've got my word. Part 2. Green Growth and the New Climate Change Deniers So in the context of this reality, of what we know will happen if we don't drastically reduce carbon emissions, what has been the response from political leaders largely in the global north? Well, what I think has been the dominant narrative in, in the global north has been a strategy of soft climate change denial. This is when politicians, uh, business leaders, media figures, etc. all accept that global warming is happening and that it's being caused by human action, but they undermine the scientifically necessary action needed to combat it in favour of like vague gesturing to green growth. And with the exception of the recently yeeted President of the United States, Donald Trump, who was a bit more on the hard climate change denial than, than soft. But this seems to be the dominant form of what's going on right now with our political leaders. Um, so I guess the question we should be asking is, can we grow our way out of this crisis? And the short answer is no. So for a while there was some big noise about how the UK has totally separated its economic growth from its growth in natural resource use. Because if, if this could happen, then surely we wouldn't need to sacrifice economic growth from climate action. Unfortunately though, the reality is much dimmer for green growth. The reason for this decoupling in the UK was actually just because of a decline in the construction and manufacturing industries and a shift in the economy to becoming a high import one. Once the footprints of trade and consumption are taken into account, this decoupling vanishes and we see increased resource use and economic growth tied together once again. This is a similar story for most high income states which have decoupled growth and emissions for some time but it obviously isn't an arrangement which is open to every state. Production has to happen somewhere, right? And increased consumption requires increased production, which requires increased natural resource use. At the global level, Bithas and Calamaris have shown that, far from becoming separated, economic growth and increased natural resource use have become even more tied together over the past hundred years. Our estimates suggest that the dependence of global economic growth on natural resources has increased by over 60% in the last 110 years, contrasting with the prevailing decoupling estimates, which suggest a reduction by 63%. We find that the actual decoupling, which began in the mid-1970s in post-industrial economies, is counterbalanced by the intensified resource intensity of several developing economies. Essentially so far, growth and increased natural resource use, including fossil fuels, have been entirely tied together. And on top of this, as an economy grows, its energy demand increases, making the already difficult demand of making a switch over to renewable energy even more demanding. But ah, you might say, what about technological advancements? What about increased efficiencies or carbon recapture technology? Won't they be able to offer us some way out to maintain global capitalism in the face of climate catastrophe? Well, yeah, th this might offer some theoretical basis for green growth. Unfortunately, it's not based on any strong empirical evidence. In fact, what we have seen is that 
increased efficiencies and increased technological development have resulted in increased growth, which has resulted in increased resource use. As it grows, an economy tends to use more and more resources, no matter how efficient it is. Hickel and Callis illustrate this well by pointing out that an elephant might be more efficient than a mouse, but that the elephant will still use more calories. Isn't that right? Do you like my horrible mouse? He's disgusting. Now I suppose you could reasonably argue that this doesn't account for technologies that don't exist yet that could massively increase the efficiency of production. But this seems like a bit of a risk, right? In our current context, which requires that we drastically reduce our CO2 emissions by 10% per year for high income states, and that's starting in 2015 by the way, waiting for potential highly efficient technologies to come along and save us so that we don't have to bother changing any of our economic arrangements seems like waiting for a sort of global warming deus ex machina. The eagles aren't coming to save us this time. The eagles are coming! In some, what the empirical evidence tells us is that basically the case for green growth is non-existent. I'd encourage you to look at the bibliography of this video, which goes over this empirical evidence in much more detail than I can possibly do right now. But this is the choice we face. Maintain economic arrangements as they are and almost certainly overshoot the two degree Paris targets, which would be absolutely disastrous. Or do something different. In this conversation, we have to keep in mind that the goal should always be to make sure that people can live in the best possible conditions. Already we're living in a world in which millions upon millions are living in poverty and the conditions have just been getting worse since the advent of neoliberalism. Our solutions to global warming then should ensure that people are living in the best possible conditions they can within the natural boundaries of the planet. And this is going to require a radical reordering of our priorities. I say radical. That's my thing that I say. We're just gonna have to overcome the cult of GDP worship and begin scaling down economic activity and consumption within the global north. And this is what we mean when we talk about degrowth. A reduction in material consumption and production. This will likely, though not necessarily, not all the time, uh, result in a reduction of GDP. But what it definitely requires is for us to get over GDP as the fetish of the age. To be clear, this differs from recession. Uh, while it's true that recessions tend to come with a reduction in natural resource use, they're also untargeted in terms of which industries they affect most, and they tend to hurt the worst off in society. And that, and that is the one thing we didn't want to happen. A spokesman said, this is the one thing we didn't want to happen. Degrowth by comparison is a targeted process, by which we begin scaling down economic activity in particularly ecologically damaging or socially unnecessary industries like uh, the fossil fuel industries, arms manufacturing, private transportation, uh, beef, advertising and the planned obsolescence of commodities. Think about all the new and basically the same iPhones that are produced year on year with planned obsolescence all for the purposes of generating profit. This is hugely environmentally damaging and entirely unnecessary. And things like that are, are things that make you laugh when people say capitalism is the most efficient economic system. But we can't just like throw millions of people out of work, can we? Yeah, that's right, me. That's that's a good point. I'm glad I filmed me asking that yesterday. No worries, John. I'm always here for you. We can't just throw people out of work. But what we can do is improve people's lives by shortening the working week, thereby opening up more and more job shares in productive and necessary industries. We can improve universal services like healthcare and education and public transport and leisure facilities. And we can ensure that people have a living wage so that they can live. We can distribute energy production to the local level by fitting every house with solar panels or wind turbines and connecting them in local grids, thereby shifting the control of energy production from distant profit-driven corporations and into the hands of communities. 
degrowth has been compared to the concept of buen vivir, which emerged out of the uh, Latin American indigenous movements and focuses on achieving a good life, living a good life, rather than constantly increasing our material consumption. A better life shouldn't just be attached to increased consumerism. Having secure housing, secure employment, shorter work days and work weeks, uh, universal health care, having public goods like parks and leisure centres and community centres, healthy, even publicly owned pubs would have a much better impact on people's lives than just constantly expanding growth, constantly expanding wealth for those at the very top that might eventually trickle down and leak on their heads. Right now we're being pissed on and told it's raining. Now this bit's just for the socialists in the audience, so if anyone watching isn't a socialist, you know, be cool. Degrowth might actually represent the first step in a transitory period towards a post-capitalist or socialist system. It directly challenges the profit motive within many industries and it challenges the constantly expanding commodification of, you know, everything. And obviously, it fundamentally challenges that underlying requirement for capitalism to constantly grow. As Ashley Dawson observes, Capital must expand at an ever-increasing rate or go into crisis. As it does so, it commodifies more and more of the planet, stripping the world of its diversity and fecundity. A degrowth platform, as I've briefly described it here, doesn't immediately transition us into a classless and moneyless society, but it does represent a massive challenge to the capitalist order as it currently stands, and crucially, it's the only way that we reliably know of to avoid two degree warming, which would be absolutely catastrophic. And while some might say that's too radical, we need to be more moderate and sensible with our solutions. Well... One can never be radical enough. That is, one must always try to be as radical as reality itself. The empirical evidence is quite clear. Global North countries have to immediately begin a process of pursuing degrowth in order to avoid the catastrophic consequences of global warming to which we are already heading. Reality is compelling us to be radical in our solutions. In her book On Fire, Part The Burning three. Case for a Green Capitalism New Deal, and the end Naomi of the Klein goddamn argues world. that this climate catastrophe couldn't have happened at a worse time for global politics. The emergent science first gained international attention in the 1980s, just as a new and aggressive form of capitalist ideology was becoming hegemonic. Neoliberalism. 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 At a time when we needed to directly oppose some of the most fundamental aspects of capitalism, an ideology was becoming hegemonic, which mandated that states only exist to support and reinforce the capitalist free market systems. This ideology is held across the liberal to conservative spectrum and has become the dominant force in opposing any meaningful climate action. The absolute loyalty that most of our political class has for neoliberal capitalist ideology has allowed a new breed of climate change denier to ride to power. These politicians who are often uh, progressive don't deny that climate change is happening or that it's even man-made, but the solutions that they propose for solving climate change are limited to mild efforts to reduce fossil fuel use in conjunction with some market solutions. These solutions are, of course, not really solutions, but are designed to create the illusion that we're dealing with the global climate catastrophe while making sure that no solution poses any threat to the capitalist system as it stands. Essentially, it places the science, which shows that we just can't pursue endless growth like we're doing now, secondary to neoliberal capitalist ideology. So anyone who pursues such strategies is effectively a climate change denier. So if, for example, you're Joe Biden and you're refusing to ban fracking, or you're Keir Starmer and you're rolling back on more comprehensive green policies in favour of decarbonising pension plans by 20 fucking 50. Joe Biden, you're a climate change denier. Keir Starmer, you're a climate change denier. Boris Johnson, 
you're a climate change denier. Kamala Harris, you're a climate change denier. And I say this not just to label anything I don't like as climate change denial, as, as I'm sure someone will comment, but it's about forcing reality to confront their ideology and about showing how these people aren't really moderates, they're ideologues committed to preserving the capitalist order over preserving the world. <laughs> Another means by which some people are avoiding the reality of the measures that we need to take to avoid climate disaster is the promotion of geoengineering projects. This can include things like pumping sulphate or aluminium particles into the atmosphere, or as some people have suggested, bleaching the sky. But we know that it was us that scorched the sky. Remember kids, being sensible and moderate means you countenance bleaching the fucking sky like the goddamn matrix before you countenance making any changes to our economic arrangements. We can imagine the start of the matrix before we can imagine the end of capitalism. Fucking hell. Geoengineering as a solution doesn't just attempt to shift us away from the scientific realities that we we just need to simply reduce carbon emissions and material throughput, i.e. it shifts us away from realities that threaten capitalism. But philosophically, such solutions tend to view the earth, nature, the climate as machines over which we can just exert our control. We can just like press buttons or pull levers and the great machine planet earth will just do our bidding. This reveals that both the purpose and the philosophy underpinning geoengineering solutions are innately capitalistic. It reduces nature to just a machine with one simple purpose, to produce profit. And as Marx puts it in the Grundrisse, For the first time, nature, under capitalism, becomes purely an object of humankind, purely a matter of utility, ceases to be recognized as a power for itself, and the theoretical discovery of its autonomous laws appear merely as a rule, so as to subjugate it under human needs, whether as an object of consumption or as a means of production. As we continue to ignore the scientific realities with which we're faced, I think we're going to see more and more interest in geoengineering in a desperate attempt to keep capitalism breathing within a world that's choking. But right now, such solutions have no solid basis in scientific reality to justify their use over just changing our economic arrangements. The simple truth with which we're faced is that we need to drastically reduce our carbon emissions, including in trade and consumption, especially in the global north, where we're responsible for the vast majority of ecological damage. And the only scientifically sound way we know of to do this is through degrowth and challenging capitalism as it exists today. And I think capitalists know this. The rain started. So I think the reason that capitalist ideology is so amenable to climate change denial is because fundamentally they know that the scientific reality is a threat to capitalist dominance. And on that, I say we agree. But what happens once reality overwhelmingly overtakes ideology? When capitalism can no longer deny the reality of climate change? Uh, unfortunately, I don't think this break will result in capitalism surrendering its interests. Instead, what I think we'll see is an even more violent expression of some of the underlying features of capitalist ideology that have been bound to it from its inception. And specifically, the ranking of different people based on their value. Right now, this clearly already exists, with states continuing with their extractivist, fossil fuel driven capitalism, which is directly hurting the lives of indigenous, global south and island peoples across the world. Their value is clearly seen as less than the profit to energy companies. But as the climate crisis continues, more and more violent solutions will be implemented. The most obvious of which will be population control. We already see these neo-Malthusian attacks on largely black and brown people, particularly in the global south, where they're seen as having too many children, despite the fact that one person in the global south has an absolutely fraction of the carbon footprint of one individual in the global north. 
We also frequently see the seizing of land from indigenous communities for the purposes of planting forests for carbon recapture as a climate mitigation strategy. We've seen such projects in places like Israel where Palestinian populations have been expelled for the purposes of tree plantations and we've seen similar things happen in Brazil and Uganda. Moves like this are really reminiscent of what the US government did to its Native American populations when it expelled them for the purposes of creating nature reserves. What examples like these show is that there is an underlying ideology within capitalism which values some mostly white lives over black, brown and indigenous ones. And as Naomi Klein so vividly explains, a culture that places so little value on black and brown lives that it is willing to let human beings disappear beneath the waves or set themselves on fire in detention centers will also be willing to let the countries where black and brown people live disappear beneath the waves or desiccate in the arid heat. And just as our current system of racism and white supremacy was a justifying ideology for the economics of trading human beings in the Atlantic slave trade, so too will it justify the brutal deaths and inhumane conditions in which millions of black and brown people who are at the pointed end of global warming will live should we continue unchanged on our current path. And just as some of us might look back at slavery and say, how could anyone stand by in the face of such cruelty? Future generations, you know, if they exist, will look back in awe and horror at the collective ignorance and cruelty of our age as we let the world burn for profit. Conclusion. The end is nigh. So ultimately things look a bit bleak. We face the embedded institutional power of global capitalism and we in the Global North aren't exactly organized and that's what's needed to force through these changes which are absolutely scientifically required to avert global climate disaster we need to be organized we need strikes and disruptive direct action the good news such as it exists is that we still have some time and it's technologically quite feasible there are some glimmers of hope, the Sunrise Movement and AOC's Green New Deal, which, although not going far enough, is a significant step in the right direction should the democratic establishment decide that they want to pursue it and not be massive cowards. Degrowth is so useful because it challenges our assumptions about how an economy should be run and it focuses on what the Global North, as the main source of emissions both historically and presently, should do. It also allows people who live in other regions the space to increase their resource use to ensure that they can also live good lives. And we should view degrowth as a project of almost decolonization, which relieves the global south of the burden of our material consumption and our carbon output. When you look at all of this, especially from the left, climate catastrophe, global injustice, the power of corporate and capitalist political leaders, then the problem can seem mountainous. But every mountain is scaled one step at a time, and the first step is knowing the path. I hope that's what this video has done, I hope that's what I've done today, is illuminated the path. Because we can do this, like we can avert climate catastrophe. It's, it's technologically feasible, and we still have time but we need to start walking today. We need to start walking right now because it's nearly dark and time is nearly running out. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you weren't blinded by the glow radiating off my porcelain skin. And I hope you weren't left too depressed by the content of this video about the end of the world. If you did enjoy it, then please feel free to leave a comment, smash the like and subscribe and hit the wee bell thingy. And thanks to Millicent, Chill Goblin, Mexi and the Cerse for lending their beautiful voices to the, to the quotes. They all do fantastic work and you should check out their channels in the description. Also, massive thank you to all my patrons who are helping me make this video and get through my PhD. And particular thanks to Paul Singleton, Tamash Kispeter, Seamus Morrison, Stephanie Beverly, 
Aaron, Sinan Kos, Jay Fraser Cartwright, Jam Tapot, and Gary Dillon. Now, please sit back and enjoy some lovely footage of my dog, because you've sat through this and you've earned it. Enjoy, there she is. What a beautiful animal. Oh, <laughs> dog on the video. There we go. <laughs> 